So it turns out, much like the Titanic, a lot of what you're dealing with as a designer lies just below the surface. Hmm. So, the implications of directing the iceberg, as I call it, or how to become a more effective designer by using objective, not subjective standards. Because um, I think a, a, a topic that really plagues the design industry is just this whole idea of subjective preference. Like one designer subjectively prefers something over another, or every client's subjective taste is really what's driving the bus. Um, and you can watch any number of other lectures by me, I'm sure I've touched on it at various points. But I would concede rather that the objective is what is driving the bus and the objective of the piece is what's gonna to lead to your uh, eventual conclusion. So with that idea in mind, I think we all understand the concept of the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Um, this idea that there's some little bit that we can see and then way down below, there's a much larger force driving what we can see. Uh, and this is very similar to just every walk of life. I mean, how many times have you heard about somebody say they got in a huge argument with their spouse or significant other and it was, you know, you don't clean the dishes or there's a huge pile of dishes. Why didn't you take care of that? And it's like, the issue isn't about the dishes. Like that only would have exploded into a much larger thing had there not been some underlying conflict there. Um, if it was honestly just about dishes type, things like that would just be resolved by going, oh, sorry, my bad, I'll do the dishes. Um, this idea of very deep seated things driving the, the tiny tip of the iceberg plays out everywhere in design. Um, and one thing that we see is that through human behavior, through psychology that we've, you know, there's numerous studies and things, have found out that much of human behavior is handled in a very subconscious way. This idea that there's things and processes and thoughts and motivations going on psychologically that are driving your everyday decisions. And that's not just how you act in the world, it's your preferences all the way down to what your favorite color is. There's probably some deep reason why it is the way it is. Uh, and as a result of that, people tend to think of creativity as like this, again, kind of ineffable force and not something that is being driven in any, con any considerable way, rather that it's just kind of out there and there's people who are creative and people who aren't. Uh, I would argue that it's really more Creativity is a, a mixture of both convergent and divergent thinking, and that any person when pushed can can get to a creative state. It's not necessarily that they start there, uh, but there's always some kind of underlying base or various way through their life that has led them to be able to make distinct connections between things that not everyone will share. So if you are able to drive at something like that, you can get to a creative solution quite easily. Um, I actually have a kind of a philosophical divide with a couple people in my industry in whether or not we should be pushing students to be more creative in their work or to teach technical expertise in their work kind of when they're in uh, college. I stand on the side of saying we should be teaching practical skills and the ability to execute creative concepts. A lot of other people in the industry would say, no, we should be pushing them to think outside the box and think creatively uh, in the idea being there that the more creative you are, the more successful you will be as a designer. To me, it, it seems more like you can just push people to be creative almost at a whim. You can extract creativity relatively quickly, uh, whereas you cannot extract raw technical talent quickly. That's something that takes years to foster and build. And so it seems like a much more worthy process for, from my point of view, to engage students in the acquisition of technical skills and henceforth the creativity will come. Because to my end, there's really nothing more tragic than somebody who has a great idea, but they can't execute it. So this whole idea that there, there's this underlying base of life experience and motivations driving everything, that plays out in design, not necessarily just in the creativity, but in the preferences you show for how you react to people's concepts. So. Uh, a further study um, even showed uh, in 2013, a brain scan showed that um, there is no idea of this whole like left brain, right brain thing. I think we tend to think of, especially in the creative industry, like there are people who are left brain and people who are right brained. There's more analytical thinkers. 
Uh, and those are people who that will not succeed as designers, but then like the left brain people, and I might even have the hemispheres backwards just because I hate this analogy so much, but the, the other brained people, those are the creative ones who will thrive and the analytical people will not. Um, and you know, maybe this is just my bias popping through, but I'm frequently described by others as one of the most analytical robotic people they know, and I'm thriving quite well in the design industry. So I feel like that's not a thing that can be proven to be true. Uh, and again, I would I would force people to really push their technical expertise, and then the creativity just sort of spills out from there. You don't have to necessarily be a creative person to thrive as a designer. Um, and getting back to the broader point there of sort of the tip of the iceberg and those underlying motivations, how this plays out in design is this whole concept that you perceive a lot more than you actually notice. And you might have an ad about a Nike sneaker or a bottle of juice or something, but you are perceiving just an infinite number of things about those ads and pieces of marketing outside of just the thing that's being marketed. Jonathan Haidt in his book, The Righteous Mind, reinforces this idea uh, by stating, we reason our way to whatever conclusion we need to reach to support the judgments we have already made for either intuitive or emotional reasons. Uh, and that's kind of the, the long-winded way of saying, you may see the tip of the iceberg, but how you perceive it is very much in line with whatever's going on below the surface. Your, your intuitive or emotion, emotional reaction is actually what drives how you perceive that little tip. Um, the tip here being the piece of advertising, the piece of design, the piece of marketing. That little tip is really not what's gonna be ingested by people so much as how it's perceived relative to the iceberg structure down below. Um, and so a quick way to sort of ferret this out in students is we play a little game where I want you to kind of look through an image and then figure out what about it would seem wrong or off and see if we can't just sort of make our way back to a conclusion that is completely and totally justified. So usually I show this image. And in this image, I ask them quickly to just identify things that you think could go in this room that would be totally in concert with what you think should be here. Uh, usually there's things mentioned like a family, kids playing, dishes, food, a dog, like very mundane household items because it is just kind of a little household there. Uh, but as a way of sort of focusing the exercise, let's consider would these objects that I'm about to list feel okay in that scene? So how about a glass? Probably. How about an airplane? Again, that one seems weird. How about a dog? I already mentioned that one. It even gets frequently brought up. How about a kangaroo? Or maybe a ball? So usually the one that stands out as odd in that list is the airplane or the kangaroo. Um, and for the kids who are already sort of wired to think a little bit divergently, they push back against the rest of the students who say an airplane would be weird. And usually the justification is like, well, what about a toy airplane on the table? Or what about a, a toy kangaroo on the table? It really is all about the context. And you can very quickly sort of emotionally and intuitively get yourself to a spot where both of those make sense. Just your, your presupposition going into it is that we are inside of a house and you probably jump to the conclusion that an airplane would not make sense there or that a kangaroo thinking about a physical animal would not make sense there. But you can very quickly reason your way to a position where it makes total sense just by either adjusting your frame of reference for the object or adjusting your frame of reference for the entire scene. So as an example to like further reinforce this, if we take a look at what is commonly perceived as the most justifiable item from that list, let's say the glass, even in putting a glass on the table, you can run into all sorts of problems with the glass if it doesn't behave in a way that you expect. So thinking about a glass, let's just put one like this there. Okay, so a glass of water sitting on a table, that's perfectly reasonable. But what about, what if the color was like neon green or glowing or emitting light? Suddenly that doesn't feel so reasonable. Or maybe it was kind of a yellowy color. Could be apple juice, could be Gatorade, now it's reasonable again. What if it were red? It's probably juice. What if it were really, really dark red and somewhat viscous? Now it might seem like wine or depending on the viscosity, it could even be like blood or something. It really gets kind of weird and hard to parse as soon as you start modifying even the littlest of variables in the scene. Uh, so what about scale? What if the glass was huge? Like that would feel wrong for all sorts of reasons. 
uh, both for your intuitive sense of what a human can hold, how much a human could consume, you know, whether or not it's relative to the size of a picture you might have seen before. Everything about the size of the object itself is going to change whether you perceive it as normal or not normal. Or what if it appeared to be a cold drink like Gatorade, but it was giving off steam like it's hot? That would be super weird. Or what if it had spilled all over the table? Even the, the quality with which it had been spilled would give you some indications as to what's going on here. Whether it was like a kid who had just drank juice and spilled it, or maybe it's, you know, prior to a murder scene for all we know. How that fluid behaves and how it has been distributed across the table are going to give us many cues about what's going on in the scene. And beyond that, what if the glass wasn't just a table glass? What if it was a wine glass? Or what if it was some other device that should, by any intents and purposes, be able to hold liquid? It just doesn't fit your conceived idea of what should be in that scene. So needless to say, at every level of analysis, you can either reason your way to a spot where it makes sense or to a spot where it doesn't make sense. And we need our reason to kind of buttress how we digest things. So this is happening at every level of analysis on every design piece that anyone's ever looked at or reviewed. So as a parent, I see this rationalization and sort of arbitrary justification system play out all the time. It's really helped me kind of confront how I deal with reality in a way that I didn't really expect. Uh, and as an example, I have a two-year-old son and he's really obsessed with dipping things. That's, he's known for it when he eats. He really like, likes to dip fries and ketchup or, you know, any number of dips. And he dips things in such a bizarre way that it just, again, makes you reconceive how you think of even mundane objects. So he'll take a chicken nugget and dip it in lemonade because it's just weird and it's, you know, a cup with a liquid in it. So why not? Right. Um, and as a, as an adult, you're like, ah, like that's disgusting. But I start to try to dissect that and it's like, well, why is it disgusting? You know, lemonade is just sugary water. That's really not that different than ketchup at some level of analysis, but it's not fundamentally different from many of the other things we dip into, like maybe barbecue sauce. Barbecue sauce is basically a crap ton of sugar with just a little bit of spice. So it's like, what makes it weird that he's dipping in lemonade that wouldn't make sense for something else? And I realize that's a really bizarre example, but you see how these arbitrary definitions have just sort of sprung up in society. And it really just takes sort of the, the innocence and, you know, lack of more clear direction from a child to just show you at face value how weird these distinctions are that we've made. Um, one of my favorite ones to, to point at is just like, take the idea of a, a jug of milk. Like that seems like perfectly normal to everybody. Even a jug of chocolate milk seems perfectly normal to everybody. Uh, at least here in the United States. But as soon as you start straying away from chocolate, things get a little weird. Uh, there's kind of a, an ideological divide here at my house with whether or not strawberry milk is disgusting. I personally love it. Again, my two-year-old loves it. He's got somewhat of an addiction. He'll just wander around saying, I want strawberry milk. We even have to convince him that he needs to eat something other than strawberry milk for dinner. Um, but my wife thinks it's just like a crime against humanity. Like why would anyone mix strawberry into milk? To me, it's one level away from a milkshake. It's delicious. It's like a socially acceptable way to drink a milkshake every meal of the day. Um, but outside of the United States, those three flavors are kind of it. You got white, plain milk, chocolate milk, strawberry milk. But as soon as you go outside of strawberry, it's like, what about grape milk? That seems just sort of inherently disgusting um, in a way that I would try it. I just can't find it anywhere in the United States. But to a lot of people, as soon as you bring it up, they're just like, Ugh, like, why would you do such a thing? Um, and you can take this idea and just, you know, extract it even further. How about pizza flavored milk? So that one violates my sensibilities. I would never want to drink pizza flavored milk. But why is it that grape is fine, strawberries fine, but pizza isn't? You know, it, it very much has to do with probably like sugar content, overall palate, things like that. But as a society, we just draw up random distinctions. And here in, you know, the United States, we've ran into white chocolate strawberry. That's it. Uh, I remember very vaguely there was a company when I was younger called Smilk. Uh, maybe I'll go Google it and try to find a photo of it that had a multitude of flavors of milk that they released into the market. And it just like failed dramatically and, you know, nobody bought it. But 
that stuff was my favorite for the longest time because I was like, hey, you can get grape, you can get orange, you can get everything just right out of the box. Um, but anyway, suffice to say, these cultural distinctions are framed up and perpetuated everywhere. Like even if you want to take this weird milk example and extrapolate it up further, you've got like cow's milk is t totally normal and accepted here in the United States, but then it's like goat's milk is kind of on the fringe. You can even run into people who are okay with it and people who are vehemently not okay with it here in the United States. But then what about like horse milk? Yes, horses can generate milk. I actually had to Google that to verify it. But what, does anybody here drink it or even talk about it? No. So like, why have we put up distinctions between a cow and a horse when they're, you know, biologically not that different of an animal at, at, at some level of analysis? Needless to say, these distinctions we make are somewhat arbitrary and very pernicious through society. They're just everywhere. So why does this matter, especially as it relates to design? Um, how this plays out in design is exactly the same thing. There are weird, arbitrary definitions that our society has constructed that no one's really articulated or written down. So it might be how much animation is too much animation? Um, what are you implying if you put blue and pink in the same design together? Like suddenly that conjures up ideas of little boys and little girls. It's like a very ingrained thing in our society to do gender breakouts by color, whether that's justified or not. How about if an item has a field of color behind it that's completely filled in? What does that imply? Is it a button? Is it selectable? Is it somehow more important than things that don't have color behind it? Or how about the size of something in relation to something else? If, if, if one item is 200% of the size of another item, naturally we would believe the larger one is of more importance than the smaller one. All of these little cues play into how you digest information in a design. And so frequently when I bring this topic up, the idea is floated as, oh, well, that's kind of like subliminal messaging. Like we can hide hide the way we want things to be perceived in our content just by how we sort of nuance and slip it into people's minds. And needless to say, this plays out everywhere. You see all sorts of ads kind of like these where it's like sex cells will try to hide a, hide a butt in our image of a Heineken bottle or something, or any various ways of slipping a subliminal message into something, kind of like the uh, the profane single screen that gets cut in in Fight Club and it just distresses people to no end. Um, needless to say, that does not work. There have been numerous studies that have shown that um, subliminal messaging like that just does not register at any, any level in the brain. So sub subliminal messaging fails horribly as a marketing strategy. And what we're starting to realize more and more is that the type of unobtrusive messaging that does slip through, kind of sneaks its way into your brain, is actually superliminal ad advertising. And whenever that term comes up, people kind of think, well, what the hell is superliminal? It's not really a term that gets floated that often. If you think about your consciousness as a plane that you exist in, and subliminal lives below it, superliminal lives above it. And how that might play out in um, society is just something going on that you're not really consciously aware of that is finding its way into your system. Um, and I think that's the, the same idea as subliminal, like it's something that just happens, you're not really aware of it. Um, but superliminal is something that is so macro that if somebody asked you to pick it out, you totally could. You just are consciously ignoring it. Where subliminal is like you, you could ask somebody to pick it out and they wouldn't be able to find it. Um, and there's a little clip from The Simpsons about it, which is kind of funny. You have recruiting ads on TV. Why do you need subliminal messages? Uh, it's a three-pronged attack. Subliminal, liminal, and superliminal. Superliminal? I'll show you. <laughs> hey, you! Join the Navy! Uh, yeah, all right. I'm in. Um, but the whole idea of this superliminal priming in action, they've done all sorts of tests and studies with it and found that it was actually quite interesting. They, they played some music in a... Uh, wine shop and they played stereotypically German music, kind you know, whatever, whatever your idea of stereotypical German music is, that's what they played in the, in a wine shop. And then on other days of the week, they played stereotypically French music. So whatever you think of that, you know, accordions, that kind of like Venetian boat ride type of music. And just in the background, 
So nothing, not like from a French composer, but things that were like overtly stereotypically French and overtly stereotypically German. And on the days when they played the German music, the sale of German wine went up. And on the days that they played French music, the sale of French wine went up. And this just clues that, concludes that these supraliminal macro cues are actually kind of infecting your brain in a way that you might not even register. And, and in fact, a lot of the people in that study self-reported little to no influence from the music in the store when asked what did they, why did they choose the wine they chose? So how this plays out in kind of our Western society here in the United States is we are just steeped in advertising. Like just go look at a photo of New York or Times Square in New York. It's just like the hyper actualization of just ads everywhere. And it's not really that bad everywhere in the, in the country, but that idea of putting ads kind of up in a macro sense all around you is how advertising is working mainly in the United States. So you see companies just trying to reinforce their brand over and over and make sure that you are hyper aware of your, their brand so that in the off chance that you go to a store to buy it, their brand feels more familiar and you kind of gravitate that way. Um, and we're seeing new forms of advertising emerge around this whole phenomenon. Uh, and it generally takes the form of like native advertising or social media influencers or some way to kind of sneakily get a superliminal message to you. Um, and there's all sorts of clips about it on the internet and all sorts of ways to dig into this topic. But I think one of the, one of the videos that clarifies it, at least to me, was this little snippet from last week tonight, which does a good job of explaining how native advertising splits from regular advertising. Native advertising is basically saying to corporations that want to advertise, we will camouflage your ads to make them look like news stories. Mm -hmm. That's essentially it. Even if you've not heard the term native advertising before, you have probably been subjected to it by now. It's when a piece of ostensibly normal content is stamped with tiny disclaimers like uh, this and this, and then contains messages that are often clear endorsements. And if you'll excuse me, I'll just take a break uh, from making this point by enjoying the refreshing taste of Mountain Dew Code Red. Mm. And then it's at this point that you usually realize, oh, this isn't the thing that I was looking for. You're just advertising the most disgusting drink ever manufactured. So with that in mind, you can look at studies like this one where, you know, fewer than one in 10 people can distinguish sponsored content um, from regular news. So we're, we're kind of taking this super liminal approach of injecting it somewhere in a very macro way, like over top of the entire news institution as a whole. And it's finding its way to you that way, which is both weird and also awful. Um, but the, the social media aspect of it is they go find somebody you already trust for whatever reason. And then once you're already there with that person, sort of in that recip not reciprocal, but uh, trusting relationship of viewing their Instagram feed or their Facebook posts or whatever, then it's like, oh, that person happens to also drink Coke. There might be a little thing down at the bottom that says like, oh, sponsored by Coke or whatever. But the whole idea there is you are going to unconsciously emulate this person or emulate their behavior if you are in line with them. And in the act of doing that, you will emulate all of the behaviors that are being superliminally advertised to you as well. Um, but the real nugget to take away from all that is just that context matters. So where these superliminal native and influencer uh, operations happen matters. So that brings me to UI and UX. And this might seem like a total just you know, 90 degree turn in the lecture, but we'll we'll tie it back around here in a second. So what are UI and UX? UI is just user interface and UX is user experience. They're, they're kind of generally lumped together nowadays, uh, especially when you're looking for a career in design, UI and UX specialist or whatever are just smashed together into one. You can go look at any job board and see that. Uh, but really, UI is a task that's handled by design and colors and graphic designers and layouts and font choices. Whereas user experience is more handled by the interaction with the device or ad or wireframes and prototypes and information architecture. UX is more about the experience as is evidenced by the X and the UI is more handled by design as we would traditionally know it. And that obviously is more visually oriented. So 
the you in both of those is user. And I think that's, that's fundamentally important to succeeding at either of them because the way you engage with someone and their understanding of where they're at in the marketing process is key to its success. So that ties back around to the iceberg concept that kicked off the lecture. As humans, we are intrinsically motivated to understand why something happened. Um, and that craving for a why drives a lot of how you interact with things and drives how you perceive things. So again, the bottom of the iceberg driving the, the tip, the, the manifested actions by the subconscious undergirding. So what you're doing subjectively up at the top, your little color choices and font choices and all that at the tip of the iceberg, don't really have that much effect on how it's going to be perceived. It's really more of the stuff at the bottom that's driving that. Uh, and I, I usually joke in class with, with this image here. And I just say, we intuitively crave why so much that if I showed this thing and said, what is this thing? 100% so far, no one has any idea what that thing is. If you do, you know, good on you. But statistically, you have no idea what that thing is either. And I'm like, okay, I, I really hoped someone would know, but nobody knows and moving on. And when I move on, you can almost see like a cringe befall the room. Everybody is just like, ugh, like I wanna know what that is now. I wish I had taken a photo of it. I'm gonna research it later. It just triggers this impulsive reaction of like, oh crap, you've put something out there in the world and it's unresolved. I can no longer deal with that. Uh, and it will be with you until you forget that that image was a thing. Uh, and after, after I explain that whole concept, I basically just point out that that thing is for helping remove wallpaper. You like put it on a drill and, and everybody gets a sense of relief. It washes over them. Uh, but that whole idea of the craving of why is really where all of this clickbaity stuff came out of with the internet area era. You see articles all the time that say like this outrageous truth about green gummy bears will destroy your world. You can't even believe it. And then you click the article and it's like, it tastes like watermelon. Like who cares? But by positing something that has this unresolved why, you trigger just an infinite possibilities of potential solutions in people's heads. And I think that too, going back to what I said before, is a good way to kind of spur creativity. Just tell somebody a problem and then they'll, you know, enumerate any number of reasons how they could solve it. And that could be creatively, it could be colors, could be anything. But then as soon as an idea is put forward, just kill it and move to the next one. Like by adding constraints, creativity kind of bubbles out. Um, but this whole whole idea that you need to sort of understand why before you can move forward is a lot of why I think teaching technical skills, again, is more important than teaching creativity. Because if you don't know what something is or why it exists, you would never think to use it. And no, nowhere is that more evident than in a place like Photoshop, where they're up to just so many tools no one has any conception of what half of the tools even do. So if you don't know what the tool does, you will never seek out to use it. And I, I think it's more important to broaden your sort of philosophical toolbox and your literal toolbox so that when you go to execute a creative idea, you have more tools at your disposal. All right, so wanting to understand why something is happening, that's where usability comes in. So I usually show this little comic because it's hilarious. Just how many times have you had an experience like this out in the world? You're like, oh, I got to use my chip. And then it says the chip doesn't work. And you're like, I ugh, like I just want to know how to pay for my crap. Um, or say you're at like a gas pump or something and everything about the information on the little pump there just makes no sense. Like there's buttons for yes and no, but also enter and cancel. Pay inside on this particular one was scratched out. There's all sorts of things going on with this number pad where it's like, why is it confusing? It should just be simple. And I don't know how many times a screen like this has said, you know, select OK. And then down below, there is no OK button. There's yes and enter. And it just viscerally makes you mad because you're like, this should be easy. This should be something that is demonstrably simple to explain. Um, or I, I personally love the front of my microwave here. It has buttons for cook, timer, clock, popcorn, the potato button, which I love. That's one of my nicknames for my kids. Uh, potato, beverage, reheat, defrost, and power. And then down below there's stop, exhaust, start, and light. Um, 
To this day, I've lived in this house for about four years now. My wife and I pretty much only hit the start button because start gives you 30 seconds and it makes more sense to just type hit start twice to give you a minute than it would to say hit timer one zero zero start. Like that's four buttons for the same action that could be achieved by one. So th this whole idea of humans finding a simpler path to things or finding a way to quickly execute things when much of that panel makes no sense. Um, Cause you're like, I'm warming a beverage. Is it gonna change the way the microwave behaves? Like, I don't know. It, that is true. It probably changes the way the waves go in there, whether it's like a rapid heating or a more gradual heating. But at the end of the day, it's like, who cares? The whole point of using a microwave is just a quick way to warm something up. Whether that takes five minutes or two, it's like, it, it's irrelevant at that point. Um, but this whole idea of confusing usability plays out in everyday life a lot more often than it does sort of viscerally on a uh, technological device like a phone or an iPad or something. But what is happening is we keep taking these industrial design exercises like gas pumps and microwaves and things like that, cameras, and remove them from the physical world and translate them into a digital world on a phone usually. Or, or some other portable device. And the act of taking a physical experience and making it a digital experience has made a lot of industrial design exercises become UI and UX exercises, which is why I think there's a huge explosion of a need for this understanding um, in our industry. So the problem is that, like I said before, our industry generally lumps these two people together. So it's much in your benefit to understand why people are behaving the way they are. Uh, insofar as it will help buttress what you decide to do as a designer. You might be very well versed in picking colors and fonts and doing layouts and hierarchies, but if you don't understand how somebody's gonna digest their way through your piece or how they're going to arrive there or interact with it, you're just gonna fail when you get into that UI and UX space. So I teach students who are primarily coming from a print background in design, so I have very little digital experience whatsoever, and I've been trying to figure out a way to quantify the single biggest aspect that changes when going from a print medium to a digital UI UX type of design. And what I've determined, at least from my viewpoint, as the most overlooked aspect of this is just the idea of time. And that seems like a duh kind of a point um, that we don't really generally think about time, but your, your question would be like, how does time apply to design? And as soon as you add a contextual gradual release of information, uh, it starts to change the way in which that information gets digested. And that's really what happens when you have somebody scrolling down a page or somebody flipping from multiple screens or hitting buttons and going to different screens and profiles and whatnot, because you never know what piece of information they're going to be looking at and you don't know the order uh, in which they are going to digest it or where in the flow they are when they hit a piece of information. and. Ideally, you would like them to progress through the information sequentially in such a way that the introduction of concept or graphic A reinforces and makes the understanding of graphic D later on make sense, kind of a laddering. Um, but that isn't always gonna be the case. And this, this way of dealing with time just fundamentally changes the way you have to think about your designs. So what I usually do as an exercise to point this out is just like, look at a, a screenshot like this uh, this is from, I think, an NBC show called Superstore. But if you just look at the shot of these two people with this other guy here at a cash register, I always ask what's happening here. And usually the response is someone's getting checked out or the lady's changing hand or emptying the till to the other lady or, you know, some mundane supermarket process is taking place. That's fine. And then I say, what if I told you earlier in the, this episode this guy was trying to get a job there because his girlfriend was helping him. And she's like, he's broke, he needs a job. And then in the, once he gets the job, that guy talks to a coworker who's like, you came here to get money? Like this place, place pays terribly. You're not gonna earn any money working here. Um, the only way to get money here would be to rob us. And then you see this scene as that guy on looks while the cash from the till is being changed. It's very obvious now that there's an implication he is going to rob the store or take the money from that take the money from that register. And that implication, when put so opaquely like that, 
is very obvious to us. And that's the same thing that's happening with a design. So if you have some piece of information presented and then another piece and then another piece and then another piece, everything that you saw before the, the let's say content slot D is going to reinforce what's going on. Um, and so you need to be hyper aware of sort of the, the implicit and explicit things you are saying so that every piece of information ladders up to a, a unified purpose and you're not just kind of buckshot throwing out disparate pieces of information or disparate design elements. So what this looks like in UI and UX is that good design creates an implication, if you will. Um, the implication is that you are laddering up to a larger purpose and you don't necessarily need to digest every piece of content to understand where it's taking you. Uh, this is very patently obvious when it fails in a industrial design circumstance. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen myriad a bad door where you try to pull it and it's actually a push or the implication of how to interact with the device is fundamentally detached from how you actually should interact with the device. And when bad industrial design fails, you, you know, brain yourself on a door. There's actually one downtown where I work that I, you can watch a hundred times a day. It'll happen. It's a pizza place. I always used to go to where the door on the left is open and the door on the right is permanently nailed or screwed shut for whatever reason. People come in through the door on the, the right when they're um, entering, which is the left door when you're on the inside. And then when they leave, they try to walk out that door that's permanently locked because it's on the right side. And in America, you come and go on the right side always. And if you've never been to this pizza place before, you just slam into the door and like fall backwards. Um, you could set up a camera and just watch it. It like without fail, every time I ate there, at least two people did it. But this is the implication of bad industrial design or even faulty industrial design. Um, that same thing, like someone braining themselves on a door is happening in UI and UX. It's just a lot more subtle to see. Um, it might take the form of somebody kind of pawing at their device weird or closing an app or just getting frustrated or shaking the phone. But when you run into a UI impediment, it just breaks your ability to interact with the design. So that's because usually the implication of what the design is putting forward has failed. Uh, that leads me to the, the random life advice of this uh, particular lecture, which is when you're at work, it is always better to arrive early than it is to stay late. The, the end result might be you work eight hours in whatever time window that is, but there is an implication that when you arrive early, you are on top of your time management. And when you stay late, you have failed in your time management in some way. So even if you are the type of person who would prefer to work in a sliding scale, or maybe you have a boss or a manager who's watching you or something, arriving early and then leaving, you know, maybe you arrive at seven and leave at four will always look better than if you arrived at nine and left at six. Like even if it's the same amount of time, uh, just the implication is generally more important than the actual behavioral act. So just something to know. Um, so as all of this relates to design, um, a lot of the things that come up when you talk about building a coherent narrative over time invariably leads you to film because that's all movies are. Movies and TV are just coherent structures and stories playing out over time. And so one thing that we can learn about how people digest and process designs, we can actually take a lot of the understanding that we've learned from movies over the decades because there has been countless number of film analysts and people trying to figure out what the formula is that makes up a good movie. And a lot less time has been spent kind of going through good UI and UX exercises just by virtue of it being so new that you can just look to movie and film and see these good characteristics play out over um, UI and UX exercises as well. Um, there's an interesting video here about the implication of left to right movement or right to left movement as it relates to strength, weakness, progression, regression. Um, and I would encourage you to go watch the whole video, but the, the nugget there is that in our society, in the West at least, in the United States, Canada area, we view left to right as, um, sorry, I'm watching a mirror, it's all backwards, left to right as positive and right to left as negative. And that, that's reinforced everywhere from every chart you've ever seen to every graph of populations, money, anything. We view going one way as positive and the other way as negative. And this is baked into everything from the way that you read a book to the way that you 
digest information and implications like that play out everywhere and they're so base and bedrock to our society that you generally don't think about them. But if you can just rewind back and start hitting these base level things, it'll just make your work that much stronger. So the whole idea that left and right are indicative of certain movements um, plays out in just like forward and back buttons in browsers. Um, the whole idea of like Tinder, when you like somebody, you swipe them, swipe them to the right. Swiping to the right is having them progress from the left to the right and right to left is you getting rid of things, throwing them into regression, putting them backwards. All of these things are true and feel that way because we keep reinforcing them as a society. Like we're adding them to the collective iceberg part, even though we might not consciously be deciding on them at the tip part, they are true because we see them true everywhere. Uh, and so as that relates to good UI and good UX, a lot of it is just playing into expectation. So keyboards should come up from the bottom screen, you know, progression through an app should go in, in a, a uniform direction. If you close out of something, it should exit in a uniform direction. Um, you'll see this in any video or graph of a good UI implementation. There are standards and consistent things that we should see, and they always ladder up to things you see in film as far as progress um, and things you see in society in general, where behaviors that have been in successful apps start to get repeated everywhere else. Uh, and every now and then a new behavior is invented that is so fundamental, we just accept it and start using it everywhere. Uh, the Tinder one, as example, the swipe right or swipe left thing has very much become sort of a, UI UX tautology in that it just appears everywhere now and it's assumed to be the way apps behave. Um, and so in sort of conclusion and summary here, the implications exist for literally everything. You cannot have something without having an underlying implication. And this is sort of the basis for most color theory and hierarchy and design as far as graphs like this, where you have certain colors eliciting a feeling. And all of that is true for myriad reasons I won't even get into. I'll probably cover in another video, but the implications of like why red is excitement and passion and makes you hungry. You need to understand these implications in order to build an effective design. Um, through my research of this, and I really don't know where else to put this in a lecture, so it's kind of a non sequitur, but I just found it incredibly interesting that in almost every primary industry, like video games, soft, drinks, cell phones, tech, like you can take any industry and fractionate it into its top three players. You see um, implications for color play out across all of them. So like red, yellow or green and blue. And if you wanna go um, understand why it's yellow or green, go watch my rules of everything lecture. But those three sets, red being one, yellow or green being two and blue being three, end up being the primary players in almost every industry. And I think a lot of that is because the implication is that you need to differentiate yourself from your competitor. So if the primary competitor breaks out as choosing red as their branding color, you would then diversify and pick either blue or yellow or blue or green. And to understand that, you can just see it play out, like I said, literally everywhere. So like video games, Nintendo, red, Xbox, green, PlayStation, blue. Soft drinks, Coke, red. Uh, if you wanna go by volume, the secondary player could be Mountain Dew, Sprite, or 7-Up, doesn't really matter. Um, all of those lumped together would be green or yellow. And then Pepsi, blue, cell phones, Verizon is red, Sprint is yellow, AT&T is blue, Tech, AMD is red, Nvidia is green, not exactly analogous, and then Intel is blue. Like all of the major players in each space carve out a little niche to be implied visually as different as they need to be from their competitor. And it just causes the color wheel to basically break out into these color cat categories for every individual intellectual property category, which is just deeply interesting to me. I'm sure I could do a whole other lecture on the implications of that. Um, but as it relates back to the whole movie thing, kind of Movies, I think, as designers, you can take a lot of cues from them. And I think it, it's a more intuitive way for you to understand how to look as a, at a design if you're coming from more of a print background, how to look at UI and UX. So much, much of the things that make a good movie make a good design. So if you have main characters in a movie, you expect them to be in 90% of the scenes or maybe 80% of the scenes. You expect their presence to kind of 
fill the the majority of the movie there's secondary characters that help support that main character you know they may come in at some points and leave at other points there's an overall narrative of beginning to end all of these things if you think about your design elements more like characters you can watch them play out through time and watch how they enter and exit the scene and how they behave with each other and how things that are larger carry more importance all of that stuff that is true of every movie you've ever watched is also true of every design um and if you want to like be hyper aware of some of these cues i would encourage you to go watch the the spoiler ending to six feet under the series it's frequently regarded as one of the best finales of all time but you can see in this clip just all of those things playing out like people who are dying slowly fall out of frame as people ascend to heaven they go up because that's where we assume heaven is um when people are progressing through life they're going left to right when they're not they're going right to left certain colors are used like all over the place whether it was done intentionally or not these concepts are reinforced um because it's all the same principles you've got main plots and subplots main characters left to right um consistent elements from beginning to end and you're showing people instead of telling them so Really, it's just all about reinforcing things over and over again. And if you look at any good UI UX implementation, you can see like, what are the main characters of that design? What are the supporting characters? What's the overall narrative? Where are you beginning? Where are you ending? Um, and I found that just in going through that helps in finding a, even just a coherent narrative to understand how you should refine and work on your design. And I think with this, anytime you have to make sort of a sweeping decision as a designer that's going to affect multiple screens or have multiple implications, you might get a little bit of a, a gut reaction that I don't want to make choice A because I'm naturally not making choice B. It's kind of Newton's third law of motion in practice. Like for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, I usually refer to it as like the donut hole theory. But to me, the donut hole analogy is more important because you, you both need the donut to define the not needed part. You can't necessarily just make an make an action in a vacuum. You have to be aware of both states in order for both of them to carry importance and behave the way that you're expecting. So how that might look in a design is like, if you make everything bold, then nothing is bold. If you emphasize everything, you emphasize nothing. Um, one of my favorite examples of this was back from my time working at a local retailer where they put sale tags on every single peg of a jewelry thing. Instead of doing like an overarching sale sign, there was just like thousands of little tags. And this whole idea of like, you have emphasized the sale to the nth degree. And in watching it play out in practice, nobody would take a peek behind those to even see what was on sale. It was just like so overwhelming, it violated the whole purpose of it being there. Um, but the idea there being that taking actions and setting up kind of an implication of what that action plays out is really the key to all UI and all UX design. Like how is your action going to play out throughout time? And the lack of choosing one, like whether that's maybe a certain screen doesn't have a button on it, or maybe a certain screen doesn't do a certain thing, that also implies that that might happen later on, or it leaves open the, the want or the craving to fulfill the why for that specific action later on in the experience. So the key takeaways here are really just, you're directing the iceberg. You're not only dealing with the superficial aspect there. Um, and how I would frame that up is just challenge assumptions with every decision you make, like what are you assuming that somebody's already familiar with? And, and don't assume that everybody's familiar with all the same things. Um, embrace objectivity. So appeal to the most broad objective truths that you can and your design will resonate more immediately. Uh, again, go check out the Rules of Everything lecture on as to why that's true. Utilize time. So interactivity introduces an element of time that you can use to your advantage and then direct people's focus. Design is often about what you're not focusing on so much as what you are focusing on. So it's that whole donut hole theory. All right, so that's it. If you found this helpful, useful, whatever, do all the YouTube stuff, like, subscribe, comment, start a discussion. That's how you get engagement and people get noticed or whatever. Uh, and I will see you at the next one.